We also know he was born in the Soviet Union, emigrated with his family, young. Uh, he tends to uh, feel simpatico with the Ukraine. Isn't that kind of an interesting angle on this story? I, I find that astounding. And, and, you know, some people might call that espionage. Sir, what evidence do you have that Colonel Vindman is a never-Trumper? Uh, we'll be showing that to you real soon, okay? That's who they are. Real soon, though, has come and gone. And surprise, there's been no follow-up from the White House on that comment, that threat about Lieutenant Colonel Vindman. But make no mistake, this is a strategy, a profoundly amoral one at that, straight out of the Trump playbook. Falsely hinted impropriety. We'll tell you about that real soon, he says. Then just, you know, leave it to hang out there. Your friends at Fox fanning the flames. No need to follow through yourself. The mere suggestion of corrupt behavior without evidence is enough to muddy the water, so the thinking goes. And if it sounds familiar, recall Donald Trump's comment about Ukrainian amb U.S. ambassador to the Ukraine, Marie Ivanovich. Trump said this, quote, she's going to go through some things. He said it to the Ukrainian president. It's a comment the ambassador has testified to, and she's also testified to the fact that she still feels threatened. But the smearing of Vindman predates that episode on the White House lawn and the attacks from Fox News, for that matter. Our friend Nick Confessori notes that by the time Trump made that comment, quote, the attack on Colonel Vindman's character and motives was already making its way from the dark corners of Mr. Trump's social media following to the front lines of the impeachment battle. That New York Times report then goes big picture, quote, while the White House has scrambled to mount an organized response to the House impeachment inquiry, there is no consistent message from Mr. Trump's team and little formal, formal guidance to surrogates. Twitter has become Trump's war room. The president and his supporters, including his family, have used Twitter to frame his defense, torch his Democratic inquisitors, and try to undermine public officials like Colonel Vindman, who have testified against him. Joining our conversation, Mark Leibovich, chief national correspondent for The New York Times Magazine, and Vanity Fair national correspondent, Emily Jane Fox. Nick, it's your reporting. Take us through it. Well, this is a story of how impeachment is being fought by the White House, and it's not from the White House. It's on social media. Mm -hmm. And here we have an attack on Vindman uh, that started with a tweet storm uh, by a retired Army um, colonel uh, living in Florida who's disabled. And he says, you know what? I remember that I served with Vindman on an exercise in Europe with Russian and U.S. forces 2013, and I overheard him saying things about globalism, speaking positively of, of Obama and the agenda of Obama, and I think he's a partisan hack, and I think he's a bad guy. Um, and, and he goes on like this for a while, and then it gets picked up, and it moves its way from this, this guy's Twitter feed mm -hmm. into Donald Trump Jr.'s Twitter feed, mm -hmm. and that out to millions and millions of people. Um, it moves through the alt-right conveyor belt. It gets out to the Journal of American Greatness, which is a web magazine. Um, it gets out uh, soon to Fox and Friends. Pete Hegseth has retweeted the story on which the thread um, comes from. Uh, and it's important to point out, first of all, if it's true, which we're not sure it is, uh, if it's true, so what? He said something nice about Obama. Um, he was talking to some Russian officers. His job at the time was to be a foreign area officer. So in, in, in a sense, if he's on this exercise talking to Russian reporters, he's supposed to talk to Russian soldiers and try to get information out of them, right? But even so, it shows you the tactic here is to, is to cast his versions on his motives and his character. They can't knock down the facts or what he's saying. So you, you have this swarm on social media coming out and saying, look, mm -hmm. he's a bad guy. Check this guy out. Check this guy out. Mm -hmm. So uh, you and I are old enough to have been around campaigns peddling in oppo. <laughs> <laughs> I think we were the only ones. But campaigns have used, have trafficked in opposition research, right. smears, um, lies since the beginning of time. But if, if, if the smear ends up in a Petri dish with normal politicians on the right and left around them, that, that usually, you, you know, is, is the disinfectant and, and reporters fact checking them. Those are the disinfectants in the Petri dish of lies and smears. Sure. Now in the Petri dish, you have Donald Trump's son, Donald Trump Jr., even Trump's closest friends say isn't the smartest of his um, uh, offspring. Um, and you have no moral compass inside the political leadership of the Republican Party. You also have dead men walking. So in that Petri dish, it grows and it grows and it grows. And you see on cable television smears against a military man. Right. I mean, I think there are a couple points worth making. I mean, one, the, the, the social media is a graveyard of social conscience on, in any way, shape or form. But this doesn't just appear on social media, because every time someone is mentioned on social media, what you can't see 
are the threats, are the disruptions to these people's lives, the, the you know, what their families go through. I mean, there's a lot of um, sort of accounting now of, of what people who get into the crosshairs of Donald Trump, of his Twitter followers, you know, what happens to them. And it, it really does mess with their lives in a big way. The other thing is Donald Trump has somewhat successfully turned the term never Trump into kind of a catch-all smear. I mean, mm -hmm. if you think about I mean, if his approval rating is, say, about 40, I mean, 60 percent of the country presumably does not like Trump, which mm -hmm. technically, I guess, would make them people who are not going to vote for him or never would, would never vote for him. I mean, mm -hmm. if you can maybe 50 percent or something like that. Now, I guess by a clinical term, like mostly it's Republicans like originally who don't who weren't supporting him in 16 and that. Uh, that group has sort of grown. I think he's usually vocal. talking about Romney. Well, he talks about Romney. Anyone who is against him, or basically. McCain. I mean, like, like in his is, head, he's usually talking about five people. Right, Jed Bush, also, Mitt Romney, and John McCain. Right, but it's also, you know, it's sort of a point of pride among people, you know, for the bulwark. A lot of people contribute, you know, here. It's, and look, I mean, you know who they are. I mean, we all know who they are. And they've been very vocal and very, um, you know, very, very willing to attack Donald Trump from the right. And it's, I mean, it obviously bothers him more than sort of the garden variety attacks from the left. But I do think that, that look, being a never Trumper in his world is a terrible thing. And if someone is serving in government and they are not for Donald Trump, they are a never Trumper. And therefore, that should be interchangeable with the notion of treason or communism back in the 50s or something like that. It's just amazing. It's all about branding. That's what this is, that they've branded anyone who is not, uh, who has gotten in his way, who has gotten in the way of the narrative that they want to spin about the Ukraine story as a never Trumper, as someone who is disloyal to this country. These are people who have given their entire lives, whose families have sacrificed so much. But the only way through this is to brand anyone who's not for them aggressively as disloyal and disloyal to the president and disloyal to the country.